verses 7 to 18. And as you might expect in Paul's letters, Paul gives quite a lot of names and he, he passes on greetings and he gives a few encouragements and exhortations. So let's read it from verse 17 to verse 18 of Colossians chapter 4. I'll read it. Verse 7, Tychicus will tell you about my activities. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with them, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among the fellow workers for the kingdom of God. And they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. So this is a classic end to some of Paul's letters where he passes on greetings and he names some people. And the passage has numerous names in it. And these names are people who are on mission together with Paul. Okay, so these are people on a mission and Paul is passing on their greetings and he's giving a bit of information about what's going on. And what we're going to do this morning is look at some of these characters and see how their lives speak to us. Because just as I might mention the name of a, say a celebrity, you might have a life lesson that goes with that celebrity. So for example, if I was to mention Michael Jordan, you might think someone who works hard. So his life kind of statement would be work hard. If I was to mention Del Boy, the life lesson is don't be a crook, it never pays off. If I was to say opera, it might be that there's a story in everything that happens. Anne Robinson, her life story might be never smile. Or David Beckham, be willing to pay the price. Or Richard Branson, life is fun, you've got to suck it dry. Sometimes when we mention names of these celebrities, there are various kind of life statements or life lessons that we learn from them, that we can kind of associate with them. And just as these guys, these famous celebrities, carry these life lessons, so some of these names in this passage, although we have to look elsewhere to find out a bit of information from them, they are packed with meaning. So the title this morning of the preacher's Calls of the Mission, because I believe these are people on a mission with Paul who are partnering with him, and actually their lives shout out something to us. And before I go any further, I just want to say I owe a lot of kind of the structure of this to Joel Virgo. Uh, he'd could do a lot better than I could, so I've ripped a lot from him, just in case he sues me. Okay, the first guy we're going to look at, we find in verse 9, and his name is Onesimus. Now, can we all say that together, because I get my tongue twisted sometimes. Onesimus. Very good, Onesimus. And then we're going to look at these other guys. We're going to look at Mark and Demas and Archippus, and I'm just going to mention Epaphras at the end. And these are the calls to the mission that they have. And the first one is Onesimus. And as we look at his life, there's a call of Welcome back to the mission. Or welcome to the mission. Because this guy, although he's only mentioned in this passage, he has a rich story behind him. And in this passage, call, Paul calls him a beloved brother and a faithful friend and a servant in the gospel. So Paul obviously thinks highly of him and rates him. But if we look at Onesimus' background, he's actually a crooked and corrupt slave. Okay? This letter has been written to the church in Colossae. And Onesimus used to be the slave of a guy in the church called Philemon. And we heard a bit about slaves a couple of weeks ago and masters, and I'd really encourage you to get hold of that preach. But Philemon is in the church in Colossae. So someone in our church, say uh, Olu Thomas, ran a business at the back there, and he's in our church. And Onesimus is his slave, okay? It might be an employee in this case in our day and age. And what happened is this guy, Onesimus, actually does a runner. He runs away from his master, who's a slave, and when he runs away, he steals stuff as well, most likely. We get this from the letter 
later on that we read of Philemon. And running away from your master in those days was a capital offense. So this guy was in some serious trouble, okay? And the whole church knew it had happened because Philemon was in their midst. And what's happened? As he's run away, he's gone probably to a big city, maybe Ephesus, where he can hide amongst the masses. And in time, as he's run away, Onesimus probably wasn't part of the church. But what may well have happened as he's run away, he's come to know Jesus, he's got saved, he's repented of his sin, his life has been reformed, and somehow he's got connected with the great apostle Paul, okay, while he's been running away. And what Paul is doing now is he's sending this crooked and corrupt slave back to the church, and he's saying he's a beloved and faithful brother, okay? So let's say Olu Thomas, do you want to give us a wave, Olu, so we know who you are, okay, owns a big company, and one of his employees who doesn't come to church one day empties his bank account, trashes his office, and does a runner with all the equipment, okay? And Olu wakes up the next morning, they can never find these guys, and they can never trace him. And what happens some years later, the guy walks in the door with a letter recommending him from a well-respected Christian that Olu knows. So now Olu is faced with this situation. He has this employee who has done a runner, emptied his bank account, and he's coming back, and someone's recommending him. Now, that's a slight picture of what this is. This guy's a slave. He deserves, in one sense, to be killed. Capital punishment. But Paul is sending him back with a letter saying, I consider this guy a faithful and beloved servant. And actually, at the same time he writes the letter to the Colossians, Paul writes a letter to Philemon, and he says this in Philemon chapter 1. He says, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Okay, Paul obviously has some relationship with this guy called Philemon, the master. He says, although I'm bold enough to command you, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. So this is quite a provocation for this guy, Philemon, who's in the church. People are expecting him when he gets, hold of, gets his hands on this runaway slave to dish out punishment that this slave deserves. And yet this slave has got saved. He's repented of his ways. He's got associated with Paul. And Paul is saying, Welcome this brother into your midst on the mission. And that's a huge provocation because we are compelled to act the same way. You know, Paul says, I could command you to Philemon. He says, yet for love's sake, I compel you. Because of all Christ has done for us, how he's welcomed us back in, I compel you to act in the same way. And we are compelled to act in the same way. And the sad thing about church sometimes is that when people fall into sin in the church or out of the church, and they come back to God, and they repent. Often they say, I know God loves me, and I know God accepts me, but I just can't show my face in the church again. And that's sometimes what people say, in fact, quite often. And that's a telling factor on us as churches sometimes. And what Paul is saying is, yeah, not only should you accept him, he is now totally one of the team and part of the mission. The call is, welcome to The mission. So as a church, we've got to guard our hearts, friends. That's the first lesson we learn in this. These names are nitty-gritty parts of life, okay? And we're going to look at applications out of these names. And the first thing is we need to guard our hearts and ask, what is our reaction to someone who walks in the door who maybe used to be part of us and had messed up and had got involved in sin or had been marred by a situation where they were totally innocent, but it all looks a little bit dodgy, okay? And they start coming to church. Or even if you're not a Christian, Okay, and you know you've got a background. I know some of my friends, they had a background that was totally modern. They wondered if they could get into church because of what church would say. You're the guy who used to do this. You're the girl who used to do that. Will people feel comfortable as they come into this church? We want to say as a church, if you're not a Christian, you may think your life has been uh, difficult or bad in those ways. Many Christians in you have had that past. Even if your life is not like that, we want to say as a church, welcome to the mission. And as a church, we need to guard our hearts and be aware of that. I know I was speaking recently with someone in church, and they just they highlighted a situation. I think, I think like that. I avoid that person in church because actually I don't know how to react to them because I know stuff about them. And that's quite telling in my heart. And the thing about this is the social barrier thing is cut across totally. In Colossae, you have master and slave being told to get together on the mission. 
That is the kind of biggest social barrier you can have. And, I, you know, we will have social differences, and it might not be that extreme. We not have masters and slaves, unless you've got a few slaves, Olu. There, no, <laughs> work them hard. Okay, unless we've got that, we don't have that, but we do have these social barriers. And the life of kind Onesimus shouts out to us, welcome to the mission. And if you're not a Christian this morning, there is a great social divide. Before we say, there's this unbelievable divide between us and God, between our holy gods and us who are full of sin before we get to know Jesus Christ. And what Jesus does is Jesus would say to you this morning, welcome to the mission. That's what he said to us who saved. He says, you give me a gift of your sin. If that's a gift, I'll take your sin. And Jesus gives us the gift of eternal life and this wonderful privilege of partnering with him. So if you're not a Christian or you are and you feel like some things have gone wrong and you find it difficult to come back, we want to say as a church that we want to say welcome to the mission. Get stuck in. We want to learn from the life of a guy like Onesimus. Maybe you're part of the church and you're stuck in, but you don't feel you're on mission. You don't feel like you're throwing your lots in and you're going forward. You might feel like you are in the family, but you might not feel like you're part of the mission. You're part of this team of Paul that was going and planting churches and getting stuck into the kingdom. And we'd just like to say as well, welcome to the mission. This is the call for Onesimus's life. Get stuck in, throw your lots in, and get stuck on board with us. So that's kind of the first lesson we learned from this guy Onesimus who used to be a slave and now Paul's recommending him and saying you actually could dish out certain punishments on him yet on the basis of love I want you to now consider this person who was very much an outsider now as a fellow brother. And for our application that would be checking our hearts, attitude to other people and doing proactive things. And also if that's you, it's allowing yourself to come in, acknowledge that the church is not always perfect but we do set ourselves to say welcome to the mission. But then we move on to this guy called Mark, and his kind of mission cry is, welcome back to the mission. And we meet him in verse 10 uh, of chapter 4, and he's just mentioned literally. It says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you've received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Now, Mark has an interesting history. He's one of these guys in the Bible who has two names and he's called different things. There's a few of those confusing ones. But he's also called John and Mark. And in Acts chapter 15, some 12 years before, this guy called Mark was the cause of a great division between Paul and another guy, a great Christian guy of the early church called Barnabas. They were going on a follow-up mission to where they'd preached the gospel. They were going to get stuck in there and see how things are going. But we read about it as they're making this decision, Paul and Barnabas. And we read about it in verse 37 of Acts chapter 15. And it says, now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. Figure that. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. From Paul's perspective, Mark was not a success story. Okay, his life lesson early on in the days is don't get involved if you're not going to stick it out. That was Mark's kind of what we'd learned from Mark in his early days. His past was checkered with inconsistency. He was one who you couldn't rely on to stick at things when you'd given them. One who certainly wasn't one of the gets tough when the going gets tough. Mark's line was Mark gets gone when the going gets tough. He came back on board. If, if he was taken on this mission again, would he bail out halfway through? Would he do that again? And Paul wasn't prepared to take that risk. That was Mark's reputation. He had divided also these two great men. But something has obviously happened from 12 years before and now because Paul is actually commending Mark. And he's saying, if Mark comes to you as a church, welcome him and embrace him. And also we read later at the end of Paul's life in another letter he writes called 2 Timothy in chapter 4, he actually says this, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. And kind of Mark's life lesson is he didn't have a great start, but he finished well. Okay, he was a, don't get involved unless you're going to stick it out at the beginning. But by the end, Paul was saying he's very useful to me in my ministry. So he kind of calls out, welcome back to the mission. Someone who was there and then somehow compromised himself. Okay, caused division in the church, got stuck between relationships, maybe was a gossip, caused a problem in relationships in the church, and kind of so he's, he, he moved out and he was shunned a bit. And the mission call that we learned from Mark's life is welcome 
back in to the mission. Because the gospel works. Mark's obviously repented. He's got stuck on board again. And the gospel actually works. And now he's very useful to ministry. Maybe you feel like a Mark. I have it at times in my life. Maybe you feel like Mark. You've been going for, really stuck in a church, going for it. And something goes wrong. A relationship goes wrong. Or there's, a, there's an issue at, at, in your job and you don't really want to show your face in church because pe- people know about it, okay? Or maybe you've taken on a responsibility and actually made a hash of it, you know? <laughs> I've done that before, and made a hash of it or something. And so you've kind of, you've almost got off track on the mission. You're almost ashamed to show your face again. Can I just say, like with the life of Mark, that need not be the last comment on your life in Christ, okay? May Christ say of all of us, at the end of our lives, he is useful or she is very useful to me, in mission. So, you know, if you feel in any way like that, take great encouragement that, you know, Mark was restored by the grace of God and we need to be the same. We also need to have attitudes like Paul that are open to recognize that people change, you know, and maybe some of you need to be Barnabas's, okay? Barnabas was the guy who stuck with Mark even when he was unreliable and he invested in him and he had time with him. And I'm sure Mark probably blundered along a few times, but Barnabas, who was called the son of encouragement, stuck with this guy called Mark. And maybe if you, some of you here have got faith for someone to come through, but actually no one else has. I've had this before. I had a friend in Zimbabwe who was employed by the church. He, he wrote off one car. He crashed another car. He lost a whole music van equipment and another one he allowed to get stolen and broken into. Okay? And uh, PJ Smythe, who's come and preached at this church before, had faith for this guy when no one else had. So after the first time he wrote off the car, he gave him a chance. The second time the car got burgled, gave him a chance. When the music stuff got stolen, he gave him a chance again. And now he's part of the leadership team of one of the churches in Zimbabwe and stuff because he was a Barnabas. He encouraged him and stuck him alongside. Maybe that's more who you relate to. If you don't feel you're in the Mark camp, you might be in the Barnabas camp and God would encourage you to draw alongside those who need vast encouragement. Michael Jordan said this, I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot, and I've missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. Let's take encouragement, friends. If we feel like we've been marks at times and we've mucked up, let us just get back on the horse and get back on the mission. Welcome back to the mission is what Jesus would say to you. The God of all grace would say, welcome back. Maybe you're a Barnabas. Another thing we learn here very quickly is that leaders are very normal. Okay, Paul and Barnabas were some of the great leaders of the early church, and yet they came into sharp disagreement about taking someone on mission with them. Okay, I think we need a realistic expectation sometimes and realize that sometimes there are going to be clashes and that just because Paul and Barnabas are these great leaders in the church doesn't mean that they're totally faultless. And sometimes it helps us to have a realistic expectation. And again, as a church, we need to check our hearts, friends, and say we want to welcome in the community around us. We want to welcome in the city which has a demographic of rich and poor, of wealthy, of different kind of social groupings. And we need, need to make sure that we are a welcoming people to them. But also people who in the past maybe have a reputation that we don't think is appropriate in church and have now come back, repented of their sin. And we need to say openly in our hearts and with our actions, welcome back to the mission. And then we get to this guy called Demas. Okay, again, literally all we have is his name in this passage, but we have to dig a bit deeper to find out a bit about his life lessons. Demas we find in verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you as does Demas. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. But if we look at the rest of the Bible, there is a great story that comes with this guy called Demas. His life, however, doesn't end well. Okay, he's one of Paul's trusted missionaries. He's in the inner circle, as it were. He's on mission with Paul. He's at the forefront. He might be involved in the leadership. He's spearheading things. And yet at the end of his life, Paul says this of him in 2 Timothy 4. He says, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Someone so close to the great apostle Paul, who Paul was investing in and believed in and recommending to churches, at the end of the life, deserts the mission because of love of this world. 
And his life kind of shouts out, do not desert the mission. Now, Paul, uh, Paul and uh, Demas might have had a close relationship. So maybe someone you've discipled through life has come through, is getting stuck into God, and then suddenly they fall away. Or maybe it's the guy who discipled you or the lady who discipled you. They've brought you into Christ, and now they've wrecked their lives. We don't know what love of this world was for Demas. But we need to ask ourselves, are there areas in which the love of this world, as it were, could it cause us to desert the mission? What is enticing us away and what is alluring us away? Is it money? Huge thing in the current climate at the moment. Okay? If you're wealthy and you've got lots of money, hallelujah, get stuck in a church. We need your money and we want it for the mission. So I'm not saying money is a bad thing. Get stuck in. If you've got a great job, pursue it. We need to influence society from top down as well as down up. We need people in these places. So I'm not mocking that. But what I'm saying is what is your plumb line decision maker? When you make a decision of your job or of your, or your future or your career, what is the main question by which you judge everything else? Is it purely money? I left school some nine years ago now. And I was at school with lots of zealous Christians. I'm in touch with two now who are still going for it with God. Most of them moved to big cities, great big jobs, no problem with that, went for the lights. Some of them, their lives are totally wrecked now because they didn't figure in Jesus and the church. How do I get stuck into a good church? Where can I find a good church? Where can I be part of a cell group and open my life up and be accountable? They got stuck in two or three years into their job before they knew it, their lives were a wreck. I've got others who have dabbled in churches, but their decisions have been based on adventure and all these other things without their relationship with Jesus Christ being the primary thing. And so they've got good careers, nothing wrong with that, good jobs, but they haven't looked at the plumb line of Jesus, his church, and their relationship with them. And slowly and surely, their lives are being wrecked. And it's the saddest thing in the world. People who used to be so close to boarding school, you'll get close, pray and worship together. And now they're just not on the radar, as it were. Friends, let us not desert the mission. These graduates, okay, if you're a graduate and you're going and you're following God's call, fantastic. Go for it. May God bless you. But in, in the face of this world, graduates staying in Canterbury for the church is an amazing thing. These are guys whose plumb line is Jesus Christ and the church and the people who are going as well, I'm sure. God has called them somewhere else. But in terms of the world, when someone says you've got a degree in whatever it is, accounting or arts, why are you staying in Canterbury for the church? Have you got a good job? And taking any job. That is a huge provocation. When I realize these guys are staying, these guys are plumb line. Jesus, his mission is church, and we're going to build here. The job is not the only thing. It can still be a good thing. Maybe it's relationships, okay? Maybe you've been waiting years as a single person, you know? And maybe you found someone. I've got a friend like this in London. She's, she's, she's fed up with Christian guys, and in some sense, I don't blame her. We need to jack her ideas up sometimes. But in another sense, she's now gone with guys who aren't Christians at work, and she's, her life is just it's going on a downhill stroke in terms of her relationship with Jesus Christ because she's found something with a guy, and, and she's getting something there that she doesn't feel she's getting elsewhere. And every time I think of it, it's a huge provocation. It's a difficult thing. You know, singleness sometimes, it's a glorious thing as well. It's a wonderful thing. The Bible speaks well of it. But it can be a difficult thing for us to take on board. And friends, do not allow it to poison your hearts and it cause you to become bitter towards God and start allowing the love of this world to influence you. Maybe it's pride. You know, maybe you don't get the recognition you deserve at church. But in your workplace or in a social club on a Sunday morning or in things, you get recognized. You're the Al Supremo. You get a lot of attention there. But you feel, so what happens subtly is you start giving all your time and energy to that and you start walking away from potential places that could build up your relationship with God. And maybe it's the, some, of the, some of the classic things that start a little bit and then entice you more, whether it's pornography or drugs or sex. They all start small. Are these things, things that we need to address in our hearts, friends, that might lead us to desert the mission? The love of the world very rarely goes from black to white. Okay, it usually goes through the grays in between and the compromises. And you know, some of these things, as I've prepared all these things, money through to these things, I've had to repent of in my heart because I know, actually, some of them still have a bit of a hold 
and a primary influence in my life, you know? And maybe as we respond at the end, you need to come before God and repent of that and say, God, change my heart on this thing. Maybe you need to confess to a, a, a trusted friend, you know, and say, listen, I'm struggling with this. Get it out in the open to trusted friends. Joel Virgo says, love of this world is loving creation more than the creator. You know, if you're not a Christian here this morning, you know, this cry of don't desert the mission, you think there's no relevance in it to me. But I, there's a provocation in here, I believe, for you as well. And, you know, what is your life mission? You know, what are you building towards? What are your decisions based on? You know, and that's all I would say. And ask yourself, what is the longevity and the purpose of my life and this mission? Friends, Demas's life shouts out, don't desert the mission. Okay, it's quite a serious and a provocative one, but it's also a, a positive one as a church. We need to draw alongside each other and say, how are you doing in this? Okay, I'm starting to know more and more people, and we talk about accountability. They say to me, what are you on about? I don't talk to anyone about that. Why would I? Accountability is a huge thing. For me. We need to have trusted people who we open our lives up to totally and who speak into our lives. So I have one or two friends who I'm just ruthlessly honest about, and they're allowed to ask me any question whatsoever. And actually, we know each other so well that we know when the other one's lying and holding back, actually. And sometimes it gets a little bit rough and you get stuck in, but we need those people. If you don't have those people, friends, there is a danger that you would be allured away. Can I encourage you to do that? Can I encourage you, if you are that friend, learn how to be a faithful friend who keeps confidence and is willing to pray for and fight through with someone. So we've looked at Onesimus' life, which is a welcome to the mission there's application in our hearts for us as a church, but we also say welcome in if you're not in on it. Uh, welcome back to the mission, an attitude of our hearts as a church, or maybe if you have a bit of a checkered past and you're getting stuck back in. And also the life of Demas, which is a serious challenge to us to not desert the mission. But then we get this guy called Archippus. Can we all say Archippus together? Archippus. Liam, is that how I should pronounce it? Okay, sorry. I was just, uh, giving you the stage to, does anyone know if I'm pronouncing it wrong? I did look it up. I just didn't like the other pronunciation. Verse 17 of chapter 4 says, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. Our last call, as it were, before we look at Epaphras at this time, is to complete the mission that you've been given us. So this guy, Archippus, has obviously been given a specific ministry to do, and the church are aware of it because this is a public letter. So he's kind of encouraging, exhorting, provoking, challenging Archippus in a public place. And he's saying, fulfill the ministry, complete the mission that you have been given. And there will be those of us in this room who have specific calls from God, that we've heard God and we know the direction we're going. There are going to be others who feel, I'm just called to serve the purposes of God in this church. Maybe you're visiting another church. But there is a specific call and ministry of the kingdom of God upon us and individuals and as a church. And the provocation from this bit of scripture, from this guy's life, Archippus, is persevere, stick at it, keep going. We believe God is sovereign. Amen? Amen. Totally sovereign. He's in charge. He does what he wants. He can do it totally by himself. But we also believe that we have the wonderful and glorious privilege of partnering with God. And actually, he chooses to work through man. Can he do it by himself? Yes. Does he always? Yes and no. He uses men and women. Okay. God's purposes. Will that happen if we don't act faithfully? God can do it. Yes. But that's not the question. The question is we get to play a part. Friends, that's how we get to partner with the sovereign God. And as we live with these calls and things, we need to keep on and stay the course. And that can be a hard thing because the Christian life is not all flashy lights, friends. There are times for perseverance and stubborn progression, okay? There are times to just go and go and go, okay? Because there are the things of life that come in on us. I remember between the age of 16 or 18, I felt very clearly that God wanted me to preach, and I had this desire to be an elder in my heart from God, which is a godly desire which the Bible encourages. And between 16 and 18, you know, you're a bit like Joseph. You have a dream and you're like, you tell everyone about it. You're like, one day I'm going to be preaching at you. Kind of, you don't know how to deal with these things. And God takes you through a long journey sometimes of uh, humility and getting your right motives. And that doesn't end, I don't think. But from then until 2005, I'd lived with this dream. You know, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I got to the place in my life where I was just like, God, 
I've given myself to this, I've watched, I've read, I've had a look, and I just don't see it happening. I just want to pack it in. I've had enough. So in 2005, I got to that place, actually, and uh, Graham Hall was preaching, uh, and he came over after he was preaching, and there was some ministry time, and he pointed at me. I, I didn't know him this well this time, and he said, don't give up your hope. God has you in his crosshairs. He has seen your faithfulness. Don't dare give up. Hold on to them. And I believe Epaphras, Epaphras, Archippus' life, get all confused, Archippus' life is the same to us, same to you as an individual and the same to us as a church. Barry and Val Jordan, stick at it. Don't give up. God's seen your faithfulness. He's got you in his crosshairs. Jeff Farnham, same for you. Don't give up. Stay, fulfill the ministry. And many others in here. Julianne, Richard, people who have served this church, stick at it. Keep going. Fulfill what God has called you to. Tom, as you call to it, stick at it. Getting to know you a bit more. The stuff you go through, stick at it. Fulfill the mission. John Wilde, keep going. Whatever form that takes. City Church, stick at the mission. Fulfill the ministry that God has given you. Whatever it may be, do not be distracted from it. But the other churches are doing this. No, 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 no. We will not allow the good to be the enemy of the best, okay? Some of those things are good. Some of those social action things are are the best, yes. But we need to seek God and fulfill the mission, complete the mission that he has given us. There are times of joyful jubilation, and we can't see anything else in the world. And there are those times where we need to take hold of this verse and say, we will fulfill the ministry that we have been given. Friends, stay the course and fulfill your call and complete the mission. That's what we learn from Archippus. And just as we come towards the close, Epaphras, I'll pop to him. In verse 12, we meet this guy. And this is a guy probably who was very much part of the start of this church and is with Paul now. And Paul says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Friends, if you are called to pray, we need you to pray. For us as a church, for the purposes of God in the city, for the purposes of God in this nation, you know, stick at it. It might be praying for that friend over and over again. If you're investing in a friend, stick at it. Pray and pray and pray. Pray for the mission. Pray for this church. Pray for us guys as a leadership team. Pray for yourself. Whatever it is, pray for it. And I, I'm not going to say much on this because Tim had a fantastic preach last week about praying for that in the gospel advance in the city. So if you can, get on our website, thecitychurch.org, and listen to that preach and follow us through the series of Colossians. So today we've looked at all these characters that we can see on the board, and I believe God would have pricked our hearts in many ways because these lives are the nitty-gritty of Christian life, and there are ways we can respond. And maybe the band, would you guys like to come up just as we... Start to finish off. You might need to respond this morning by repenting of your sin and saying, God, I'm dabbling in the world. I know that it's going to lead me astray and I'm trying to stay on the mission and I'm trying to dabble in that. And I believe God would say, you need to come before him and repent and confess your sin so that you can get on this mission with all your minds. If you're not a Christian this morning, God wants to bridge this great divide that's even bigger than slave and master in the ancient world. He wants to bridge this divide. Only the cross of Jesus can do that. In his glory, how can the cross be glorious? It's glorious because it means you and I get to know the Father in heaven and have a relationship for him and build something that lasts beyond the grave. Amen? It's the most fulfilling, most exciting, most adventurous, probably the most challenging thing you'll ever do. But we want to say welcome to the mission. Maybe you just want to come up and say, I'm tired and I just want a fresh zeal, God. Okay, so we're going to have the ministry team up here, do you guys want to stand? I'd love to pray for us as we respond and worship our God. Father, we love that your word, Lord Jesus, doesn't uh, cover up the cracks. We love your word, Lord Jesus, that gets down to the nitty gritty of our lives, Lord, and, and, and talks about the faults and the good things that your people do. And we say, as a church, we want to respond. Can we do that together? Are we on board? And Lord, we say we want to be a church that says welcome and that says welcome back. That doesn't hold prejudice, Lord, that takes sin seriously, but Lord is full of grace because we know 
if it were not for the same from you, we would be absolutely nowhere. So Holy Spirit, would you come now? Touch our hearts. If you, if you need to respond as we worship, come up. If you come up, it doesn't mean we're looking at you about faults. You might be coming up and saying, I want to pray for this mission. I want to commit myself to praying for this church and this mission. You might want to come up and say, I just need strength to keep going. I just need strength to keep going. Okay? Maybe there are others who think their eye is off the ball. I've mucked up. I've just never had the courage to get back on the horse. I've never had the courage to take another game-winning shot in case I fail. Can we say, come, get back on the mission. Welcome back to the mission. Holy Spirit, would you come? We pray right now, Lord. Mold us as a church. Thank you for the mission. Thank you. We're together on a mission, Lord. This wonderful truth. You know, don't wait until we start singing. If you want to respond now, come up. Lord, we say, come, own us, Lord. We ask for strength to complete the mission you've given us, Lord, to reach those who don't know you. The 60,000, Lord, we're a church of 350 going on. 60,000, God, come, we pray, and strengthen us for the mission ahead. Amen.